Well, hello. Welcome to today's webinar titled, The Intersection of Culture and Technology, Capturing Improvement Where It Happens. I'm Mark Rabin, VP of Improvement and Innovation Services for Kinexus, and I'll be the host and moderator today. And I'm very happy to be joined by Matthew Canestraro, who's going to be our main presenter. So I'm really excited to have Matthew Canestraro as a presenter today. Matthew and his company are customers of Kinexus. Matthew um, gave a, a great presentation at our Kinexus user conference back in November, and we asked him to join us on the webinar today to expand on that presentation, give us uh, more detail about what they are doing uh, with Lean and continuous improvement, as you're going to hear about. So Matthew is an operations analyst in the sheet metal group at J.C. Canestraro, which is a mechanical contracting firm in Watertown, Massachusetts. He'll tell you more about the company. He oversees um, the development and deployment of a strategic approach to data collection, analysis, and distribution as a pilot program within the Sheet Metal Group. He works collaboratively to implement process improvements that are informed by data analysis and lean principles. So with that, Matthew, thanks for joining us. I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you for that introduction, Mark. I'm really looking forward to this webinar today. Uh, just to start with a little bit of an overview about the, what we're going to be talking about, to kind of give you that high-level view, I'm going to start with a background of J.C. Canestraro and the factors that led to the need for an improvement software, and then I want to go into how we use Kinexus and why we set it up that way and really kind of highlight some of the logic that we use that's something that can be transferable to you uh, to inform the way that you think about any kind of software deployment and specifically deploying a software like Kinexus. Um, then I really want to go into what kind of results that we're seeing and how technology influences those results. And then I'm going to wrap it all up by letting everybody know what we've learned so far. And I really hope that there are some valuable takeaways there. And the conclusion for everybody that to bring back to your company is whether or not you're in the construction industry or the um, healthcare industry, whatever industry you're in, I think that there's going to be some learning that will apply to your organization. Uh, so just a little bit of background on what we do. Uh, mechanical contractor, uh, we design, fabricate, and install uh, all of these different systems for commercial buildings in Boston. We specialize in hospitals and labs, and so a lot of the work that we do is relatively large and tends to be complicated. Uh, I think more importantly, though, we're a family business. Um, and this is a photo of my grandfather driving with most of his kids in the back of a truck, something you wouldn't do today. But we've been transformed by technology. And here you can see uh, the photograph of a bunch of mechanical equipment laid out on a roof. And on the, the left-hand side of your screen, what you're looking at is the 3D model that we drew before anything was fabricated or any material was sent to site. And I think that that's really important to understand that, like most organizations today, technology is a core part of all of our workflows. Um, from design to installation, the, it's a tool that everybody uses, and that is a really important part about how we use Kinexus and how our improvement culture functions. Um, and so I, really technology transformed us into a learning organization. The, the rise of these 3D modeling tools um, allowed us to, to bring in a lot of young faces into the office. We've grown tremendously. And we've also had a strong use of co-op programs, which are similar to internships, that have brought a lot of st young students into the office that have then uh, grown in some of some cases into key leadership positions and so what this means is we have a lot of people who are learning every day and before we had a continuous improvement culture we had this learning culture and I think that that was a really important piece of our success with kind access was having a group of employees that were engaged in learning about the work they were doing and asking why on a daily basis 
and the way that we use Kinexus builds on that pre-existing culture. So before we got involved with Kinexus, we launched our own internal continuous improvement program and we tracked the improvements using Google Sheets. Uh, speaking with a number of other companies on Lean Journeys, this it tends to be a pretty common approach. And here you can see uh, the Kaizen challenge that we announced on Red Sox opening day in 2013, just to give you a sense of, of time. And we really had a good number of improvements come in right away, but we ran out of gas. I don't know if this chart looks familiar to anyone, but this is our number of improvements over time from April 2013 to March 2014. And as you can see, we flatlined, which in my opinion meant that the continuous improvement program was dead. Uh, at least it wasn't breathing. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board with our lean initiative and thought, what can we do to jumpstart these improvements, to get them coming back in again? And so we rolled out 5S training in all of our fabrication facilities. And the before and after photos are pretty striking. As you can see, the in that after photo, we were able to really deploy all the 5Ss there. Um, I'm not going to go really deep into the 5S methodology right now, but what's important about it is that the 5S methodology gave our shop teams a shared understanding of what we were trying to improve. And that allowed them to see more opportunities for improvement. In fact, there were too many opportunities improvement to manage. Here's um, the, the way that managing those opportunities progressed from tracking them simply on uh, pads of paper and then eventually the shop foreman needed to put together an Excel spreadsheet. And then we found Kinexus. And really it was that success of the 5S training that drove us to look for a better solution to tracking improvements. And then here's the, the most recent snapshot of our performance in the software. And as you can see, uh, we have about 350 users in the system. And so we're getting some pretty good performance out of all of the users with 2,100 completed improvements in the last six months. And one thing that users of Kinexus might notice that's uh, a little peculiar about this chart, and I'm going to point it out for everybody else, is that there's not a very large space in between submission versus completion. And that has to do with the way that we have set up Kinexus to emphasize bottom-up improvements and to make it very easy to bring an idea from conception to completion in the software. Now, some of the key points that I want to talk about now that I'm going, to, I'm going to go into a section highlighting our use of Kinexus is that improvements occur at Gemba, the place the work occurs. So capture them there. It's really hard to overstate the importance of that. As soon as there's a delay between the origin of the idea and then getting it into the system, you run the risk of someone forgetting to submit it someone not submitting it accurately, it's becoming extra work for them to submit it because they have to go back and do it. And you sort of separate tracking improvements from making improvements. And that's a really important distinction that 
we want people to to understand those processes sort of as one and the same that Kinexus is an improvement platform. It's not just an administrative tool. Now the second key point is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And this is sort of a mantra at our company and it really informed the way that we set up Kinexus and the way we utilize it today. We don't have a lot of approval built in to our default settings in Kinexus. And so often employees are given latitude to make changes without a manager having to approve them. And that's something that carried over from our initial attempt at sparking a continuous improvement program. I don't know if you were able to read the flyer. I kind of blew by it, but it sort of highlighted that when we first rolled out continuous improvement, we didn't have to have manager approval for most improvements. The third key point that I want to talk about is that seemingly unique jobs can be broken into small repeatable steps. And this is important because one of the foundational principles of Lean is that variation is the root of all evil. And the, the fact of the matter is, the more standard work that you can create, the more successful you'll be at predicting how long things are going to take, the easier it will be to improve processes because the improvements will apply all of a sudden to every time that small repeatable step is deployed. And it's really, even though it's sort of an abstract concept, it's it's really important to kind of wrap your head around, for, in my opinion, that that truism that there's no no such thing as a truly unique job. Right? It's just a unique sequencing of these small repeatable steps. So now, one of the key ways that we use Kinexus is to track two different types of improvements, adopted improvements and opportunities for improvement. Right? Now, in the system total over time, we have 3,032 adopted improvements compared to 1,287 opportunities for improvement. So we're putting these adopted improvements in at a rate of about three times greater than we're putting in opportunities for improvement. And if you remember looking back at that slide that showed our improvements over time, submission versus completed, there's, a, I'm going to flip back to that now. Those two lines are very close together and that has to do with the way that we utilize these adopted improvements. Now, the difference between an adopted improvement and an opportunity for improvement is that an adopted improvement is a change that someone has already made to their work. And these are, are generally low investment, and they have the potential to have a high return. And they don't require anyone else to chime in or to approve the resolution to go from the conception of the idea to the completion of the idea. And we made it as simple as possible working with the team at Kinexus to really meet our needs to have people quickly submit adopted improvements. Now, an opportunity for improvement, by contrast, is an idea or a place that someone recognizes waste. And in order to resolve or in order to bring about their idea or to eliminate that waste, they need help from someone other than themselves. Often, you, you can't implement your idea in a vacuum, and that's really when the opportunity for improvement is an important tool to utilize. Now, the reason why we don't use only opportunities for improvement is because for those ideas that are relatively straightforward to implement, 
we think that the opportunity for improvement creates an unnecessary amount of waiting. And what really drove us to develop this distinction is the lean concept of flow efficiency. And so we set up Kinexus in a way to maximize flow efficiency for our improvement work. And so this is just a quick slide that illustrates how to calculate flow efficiency. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, I'm going to explain it a little bit. Now, you have a, a standard process consists of periods of working and then periods of waiting. And it's not until all of the working and waiting is complete that the process is done. And so in the case of an opportunity for improvement, it's not until whoever the responsible party is hits resolve that that opportunity for improvement is closed. And the way that you can improve your flow efficiency, if you look at the way it's calculated here, it's work over divided by work plus weight. And so you, if you can eliminate the amount of weighting in the system, you'll improve the flow efficiency. And this is a, a really key concept in Lean that I think everyone who's unfamiliar with the term could really do well to go research it further. I don't want to spend too much more time on it now, but one great resource is Nicholas Modig's book called This is Lean, especially if you're in the healthcare space. A lot of the examples that he draws from are, are related to healthcare and hospitals. And so the, the takeaway here is that we really set up that adopted improvement to eliminate waiting. And so that means the value of an improvement is delivered more quickly. Now, I want to just give some examples of how we're actually utilizing these two different approaches, the opportunity for improvement and the adopted improvement in practice. Now here, here you can see this is an example of an office opportunity for improvement. And really the crux of this opportunity for improvement is that we had a recurring process that we had to do for one of our key clients and there was an opportunity to automate it. And you can see in the outcome that we created an upload template, the information goes directly to Massport, the client, and it eliminates hours of manual entries. Now, the, the person who came up with this idea, Angie, didn't have the ability to implement the change. And so, this was important that she was able to join up on a team with Will and with Steve who actually work in different departments than she does in order to bring about this change that saves about eight hours a week. And without the opportunity for improvement, it would have been really difficult for Angie to bring that idea to fruition because it required her to collaborate across departments. Now, here are a couple examples of what adopted improvements could look like. One of them is about customizing mouse buttons. Now, if you were with us earlier when I had that image of a model of that mechanical equipment on a roof, th that's what this mouse shortcuts AI is about. It takes us a tremendous amount of time to populate those models with the materials that we're going to fabricate and install. And it's one of the most important parts of a job. Now, by utilizing shortcuts on a mouse, this coordinator who's responsible for generating those models is able to do that job much more quickly. But it's a change that didn't require anyone else's input but because it's logged in Kinexus, our hope is that it becomes part of our institutional body of knowledge so that the other coordinators might look at it and say, hey, you know, this is a great idea and I'm going to deploy it too. 
And the same thing can be said of this meeting notifications AI. In fact, this is actually one that I, I borrowed and implemented in my own uh, work, that the, the default notifications in Microsoft Outlook often aren't sent out at the right time. And so I, in fact, changed my default notification and then I also adjust the notifications depending on the length of the commitment so that I'm always notified of a commitment at the right time. And that's something that sounds really simple. And for some reason, I wasn't in the habit of doing it. And it has made a tremendous difference because I need to check my schedule much less often. And, and it was something that it just saw... I took me seeing that someone else did it to think, hey, that's a great idea. Now, here's an example of a, a field AI. Or actually, before we move on from the office AIs, one thing that I want to highlight here is that both of these AIs have to do with technology. And in fact, we found that about 80% of our AIs are technology-based. And it's really important, I think, to recognize and understand that no matter what your industry is, technology is probably a key part of the work that you do. And so by having a, a, a platform like Kinexus that's technology-based for tracking your improvements, which are likely to be related to technology, there's a synergy there that people understand Technology is something that's evolving and growing, and we're using the tool of technology to improve the tool of technology. And that positive feedback loop has been a great advantage for us in getting our improvement culture off the ground. Now, here's an example of a, a field adopted improvement. And it's related to the way that fall protection is organized on site. So it has a tremendous time savings implication uh, and also a safety implication. And I think one of the important things that I want to highlight about our work and success of getting Kinexus up and running in the field is that all of our foremen, our crew leaders, have iPads. And that's because an increasing amount of their work has to be done electronically. And so going to a continuous improvement platform that's technology-based means that our foremen who have their iPads at their, their, their hip all day had a way to track improvements without having to deal with managing extra paperwork. Um, and there was definitely some training challenges on the, on the front end because a lot of these uh, crew leaders only know how to use their iPads for work, but the, the payback has definitely been there. We've had really good success getting adopted improvements in from the field. Now, I want to go back to the shop again, because this is one place where we've had a tremendous amount of improvement, but we actually don't have very much data coming in from Kinexus. And the reason why is because we don't have a lot of technology in the shop's workflow. It's something that the workflow is preceding the shop and then following the shop. They're both technology driven, but there's kind of a vacuum. And that's something that we're working to change. But for the meantime, it's meant that, that there's been a little bit of a difficulty in deploying uh, kind of access in the shop. Now, here's an example of us uh, using technology a little bit better in one of our production facilities in a shop facility. Um, the, we're trying to, to use these TV screens to replace paperwork that shows the shop team what they need to build. And hopefully, as we move forward, we'll be able to get kind access up and running on these screens as well. Uh, but now, just to kind of um, 
wrap up this explanation of how we use Kinexus and how technology and our culture inter intersect. I have a, a few thoughts I want to share. It's technology, it's not just how we improve, often it's what we improve. And so we should remember that technology is a growing, changing, improvable thing. And the way that we set up Kinexus reflects that reality because we were able to have Kinexus sort of set up the software in a way that made sense for us, that leveraged th that concept of flow efficiency, and it led us to have really good results. But it took thinking about how to improve the technology to get to that point. And then also technology makes it much easier to acknowledge improvement, and that acknowledgement that's a key behavior that shapes culture. And then also technology makes it easier to socialize improvements. Kind of like what an example of that socialization is how I started changing my Outlook notifications just as Courtney did. That's her socializing that improvement. And, and that's helping to set culture because that, that, that socialization leads to an ability for people to share behaviors. And those shared behaviors are what make up culture. I mean, a sort of silly example of that is that it's in our culture to hold the door for people. But that's a shared behavior, and it's culturally relevant. And so that's really comparable to me changing my Outlook notifications because now that's a shared behavior, that now that there are two of us doing it. Um, and now to, to kind of wrap up the presentation, I want to talk about what we've learned through the process of deploying Kinexus. And hopefully these are some takeaways that you can bring back to your companies. The first big piece is you want to define success and then design a system that will be able to support it. And so for us, success meant having really high engagement and a large number of adopted improvements. And we thought that that's what success looked like, or we came up with that definition because we knew that flow efficiency is so important and that by having really high engagement, we would be able to have an improvement culture. Now, the second thing that, that we've learned that's really key is that routines build behavior and that most routines involve technology. And so the fact that Kinexus is able to follow our employees around means that they're able to make a habit out of coming up with improvements. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we've seen so many technology-related improvements, because people are capturing those improvements while they're doing them. They're, they're at their computer, they're coming up with an idea, and then they're entering the improvement in. And that development of a routine built on technology is helping us build behavior and, and those behaviors are what shape culture. And then really just to like wrap it all up, the trajectory of this talk was really to sort of highlight how we went from a learning organization where people were learning for the sake of learning because there were so many uh, younger employees because there were so many students who were working here that they were hungry for knowledge and that was leading to a lot of great questions being asked. And we transferred that energy for learning into an improvement culture. And what that means is that now the learning is leading to a change. Instead of just asking why, people are asking why and then why not this. 
And that's what I think has really led to us starting to see this positive improvement culture that's really important, we think, for our success as a business. And it lets us leverage our employees as a competitive advantage. We invest such a tremendous amount in, in everyone on our team and having a platform like Kinexus that lets us deploy continuous improvement allows us to get the most out of everyone. It means that everybody's empowered to improve their work and so people aren't as frustrated with their jobs because they have the power to be the change they want to see. And I think that that um, really wraps up the stuff that I wanted to cover on this webinar. So I know that, that Mark has some really important announcements that he's going to make, and then we're going to do some Q&A. Great, Matthew. Thank you. And we've had questions come in. Uh, I had a couple questions that came to mind as, as you presented, and I would encourage people to continue putting questions into the question box, and we have a good amount of time to cover those. Before we get to the Q&A, and while those are still coming in, I want to tell you about our next webinar. It's going to be on Tuesday, March 28th. We're going to be joined by Karen Ross, will be our presenter, talking about, I think, a really important topic, regardless of your industry, how to coach for creativity and service excellence. Karen is most recently the co-author of a new book, um, co-authored with um, the very well-known Jeff Liker from the University of Michigan, the latest in the Toyota Way series. The book's called The Toyota Way to Service Excellence, Lean Transformation in Service Organizations. So I think this will be great for people in healthcare, government. Um, Matthew, I think people in, in, in your company will uh, probably get a lot of this, or anyone who is in you know, a, a transactional or administrative department within a manufacturing company. Karen's going to have a lot of really um, actionable insights, so we hope you'll join us. You can register uh, today, even if you want, uh, at kinexus.com slash webinars. Again, that'll be Tuesday, March 28th. Dr. Greg Jacobson and I are going to be doing our next Ask Us Anything uh, video kind of podcast webinar. Um, it's going to be on April 4th. Um, Greg is, of course, uh, a co-founder and CEO of so we do these 30 minute calls, submit questions, topics, continuous leadership. So you can register and submit questions for this again at kinexus.com slash webinars. You can find our first 11 episodes if you go to our Kinexus YouTube channel. Some other stuff you might be interested in is our blog, if you go to blog.kinexus.com or just go to www.kinexus.com, you can find the blog under the Learn menu. If you go under that menu or the main webinars page, you'll see a link to our webinar library. The webinar is on demand. We've got a couple years' worth of webinars, uh, lots of great content there. We'd encourage you to go and look at that. You can also find those webinars on our YouTube channel. And we also want to tell you about our podcasts. So we are doing a podcast series where we put the audio from these webinars in there. In fact, that was uh, an opportunity for improvement uh, given to us by one of our customers. He said, I would love to listen or to re-listen to a webinar in the car. And so we put those in a podcast. We're also doing other interviews, and, and sometimes we're kind of audio booking our blog posts. So I would encourage you to go to kinexus.com slash podcasts, or you can search for us in your favorite podcast directory. So here's our contact information, uh, including email addresses if you've got follow-up questions uh, for Matthew. But let's uh, take a question here from Jennifer, thinking back to uh, running out of gas and, and that slide you showed, Matthew. Um, how did you identify what constituted an improvement at, at that stage of your improvement process? So the short answer is we didn't. And in fact, that graph mixes together adopted improvements and opportunities for improvement. 
because when we deployed that system of collecting adopted improvements and we didn't give an alternate channel for opportunities for improvement, people with opportunities for improvement ended up submitting them through a, a format that really couldn't process them. And so that was one of the key features that we got out of deploying Kinexus was the ability to distinguish between and train people on the difference between adopted improvements and opportunities for improvement. Related to running out of gas, I mean, one question I was going to ask you, and I, you know, I think you touched on some of this as, as you talked about your new approach, but maybe if you could summarize, how do you prevent running out of gas in the future? How do you anticipate, or do, do you talk about that, or are you just doing the things that keep people participating? I think that one thing that we do is we, we now mention and acknowledge improvements in the progress in Kinexus at every company-wide meeting. The, all the managers are encouraged to keep track of the success and the health of the improvement program within their department. We have a, an internal lean leader who's been very active in helping managers get their dashboards on Kinexus set up properly. And so there are really a couple, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. And there's no silver bullet mm -hmm. to keeping this thing running all the time. But that, that constant attention is really important. And so, like, those are just a couple of the ways, right, making sure that everyone has a really good and useful dashboard so that they get something out of using the software, acknowledging the improvements, especially in front of large audiences, and then training uh, managers on the importance of continuous improvement. I think those are three of them, the key things that, that we're utilizing right now. Yeah, life would be a lot easier if there actually were silver bullets available for this. So um, I appreciate your answer that, yeah, it takes persistence and work and effort. Um, let's see, Craig asked, how do you categorize the AIs to make them easier to find and apply by other workers? Ah, so that's something that we're, we don't have a good answer for yet. I think we've been utilizing the, the tagging features in Kinexus. You're able to assign attributes to an AI, and people are able to do that through the adopted improvement workflow. But because we made it so simple, they're able to skip it if they want to. It's not mandatory to add attributes. And that is in line with our mantra, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. um, and so currently, one of the things that we're trying to do is we've assembled a lean team uh, made up of people from all the different departments. And one of the things that they're, gonna, they're doing, they're in the process of doing, is trying to filter through the adopted improvements to find ones that are worth socializing so that uh, we can distribute those to people who otherwise wouldn't be going into the software to find them. But that being said, Kinexus does have a search feature. And so even if there aren't attributes assigned to an adopted improvement, you're able to go in and look up uh, what people have done. And so like one example of that was I, I was having a challenge or I had an opportunity for improvement. I had business cards up the yin-yang in my office. I don't know if anyone else has that problem, but they get, like, everywhere after a conference you come back, and you have so many you don't know what to do with them. And so one of our employees found a great app that, that they it – was, it wasn't free. It was like a bot app that let them scan in all the business cards so they didn't have to keep them anymore. And so that was, so I just searched business card in Kinexus and up came that, that improvement <laughs> because I knew that someone else had that same problem. And I think that that's maybe not something that we do the best job utilizing, but often if someone has, if you have a problem, it's, you're probably not the first person to have it. And so the search is really like the first line of defense. 
Yeah, and so you answered, William asked, um, can they be searched for? So yes, they can. But he also asked, does your company require that all improvements get documented? No. No, we don't, we don't require it. We encourage it. But there are definitely people who make improvements that don't end up in the system. And that's something that there's a really delicate relationship between a successful continuous improvement program and a mandatory and mandatory continuous improvement tasks. The and sort of figuring out where the right line is there in terms of what you require people to do and what they do because they're excited about it and because they feel encouraged to do it um, is something that I think every company needs to figure out culturally what makes sense for them and, and put the line in the right place. And so for us right now, it's not, we don't require all the improvements to get in there, and we don't have it written into every job description that it's required for that position to improve their work. But those are things, especially that at adding that job requirement, that a lot of really great, high-performing, lean companies do. And we might get there eventually, but, but right now we're not there. And I think that you run the risk of people resenting the the improvement initiative if you if you make things mandatory. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I've seen that happen in a lot of organizations. If if you make it mandatory and you set or and or you set a quota, people will check the box and uh, maybe not come up with anything that's real meaningful and you know, I think you have to tap into that intrinsic motivation. Um, let people work on things related to safety, making their work easier and less frustrating. I've, I've found there's there's just there's it's, it's it sounds good that you can you know require it or make it mandatory, but um, I, I think that's a really important point to um, encourage it, um, like you said. Um, another question from Greg: Can you give some examples of how you socialize some of the more recent AIs or OIs to increase their adoption? No, it's actually not something that that we've really done successfully yet. I think that the all the examples will continue to be anecdotal of people using the search function to find one and then telling somebody else about it. The I mean, a couple of examples of them off the top of my head is that uh, someone found out a way to batch process PDFs that basically put like put a stamp, a digital stamp on a bunch of PDFs at a time. And that's something that impacted a lot of different workflows in the company that has been adopted more more broadly. I know that a lot of the the shortcuts and hotkeys related to the um, coordination software that we use have been something that there's an increasing interest in. But the there's not we we don't have a formal socialization process yet. It's something that's currently a work in progress, but I think that we're at a really great place now with the number of improvements that we have that it's starting to actually look like a, an institutional body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, related question to you know the requirement or, or mandatory. Jeff asked. Many employees think that some kind of financial reward tied to an idea will help. I know there are many valid reasons to shy away from that. Do you provide financial rewards? Yeah, so the, this year we actually included it as a, a, a goal for people that would influence their bonus. And so by, by documenting a certain number of improvements over the course of the year, they would um, basically like ensure or that they would hit, um, they like get a certain percentage extra of, of a bonus that varied employee to employee. And it's not something that we're going to be doing next year. I think that the it led to a number of improvements that were entered in just for the sake of entering an improvement. It definitely had 
led to it could have led to a number of great improvements, but it it sort of poisoned the well, and you can't separate the good from the bad. And it, I don't I think it sort of convoluted the real health of our improvement culture, and so it's not something that we're going to be doing again. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the that's a whole you, you could give a whole presentation on the. <laughs> right. And I'm sure, Mark, that you have given a whole presentation. In fact, I think I've seen it on um, the right ways to motivate employees to improve. So we 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 have touched on that in uh, some past webinars. It's not necessarily in it. You could do an entire webinar, but um, yeah, I think you know, if, uh, some of the older webinars about how to get people to buy into continuous improvement touches on that quite a bit. How to tap into intrinsic motivation, and you know, I think. There's a book from a couple of years ago, Dan Pink wrote called Drive, that talks about the power of intrinsic motivation and it points to research and I think very practical situations where extrinsic motivation works, the problem is the side effects. So extrinsic motivation actually hampers creativity and I think creativity is really important in an improvement cycle. Um, Extrinsic motivation over time replaces intrinsic motivation, and people get sort of you know addicted to uh, the idea of a, a reward or a bonus, or you know they they get viewed as unfair in different ways and end up squabbling over the amount of the uh, amount of the bonus. So, I mean, I think the healthiest improvement cultures are an environment where people feel like the company's success is aligned with their success, not just next week's paycheck, but success over time, and, and I think that's part of the underlying culture that leads to uh, a culture of improvement taking off. Having a culture of learning, as you talked about, Matthew, uh, is another important piece of the puzzle. So I don't know if you have any, any other reactions or thoughts to that. No, I, I think that's a great summary of our experience, what we've seen, and, and how things have been going. Yeah. The, some of the most valuable improvement ideas that we got came out of the shops during the an initial implementation of the 5S training, and that training really in a tangible way made the work better for the workers, and that motivation seems to be the most powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just I'll, I'll tell a quick story I think I might have told in one of the webinars. And, you know, and I wouldn't fault anyone for trying incentives, you know, you try it, see how it works, and, you know, adjust accordingly. But you know, I know one organization that had sort of run out of gas a little bit, and they were trying to think about how do we kind of reinvigorate the improvement program. So they started doing giveaways, and, you know, they said, hey, you know, people who implement improvements will be entered to win an iPad and stuff like that. And they got a short-term spike in participation. And then it fell right off again. And if they ran another contest, improvements spiked up. And as they talked to people and got feedback, people were quite literally holding back ideas until another contest period was being run. Mm -hmm. And so the, organiz the organization said, okay, you know what, we're, 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 we're going to stop running contests. They had, they had to try to re-engage people around um, other reasons why they should want to participate in or help document their improvements. So, and I, I think that... That's one of in in that story lies another really important lesson, which is that once you commit to pursuing a strategy of continuous improvement, you can keep at it and keep trying things until you find what works. Mm -hmm. And that's really sort of been a highlight of our experience with this is that we're learning as we're going. And being honest about that is important because it allows you to change course if you explain, you know, why you're doing it. And that openness is also really important because it fosters trust and sort of understanding that everybody is doing this improvement thing together, even the people who are designing the improvement program. And the I think for, for people who are on this journey, it's something they'll all recognize is that not every strategy works. Strategies that work sometimes don't work all the time. And strategies that used to work don't necessarily continue to work. Mm. Yep. And so you really just have to keep 
keep at it, and it's a constant process of problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a great lesson. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. We have a few other questions here. Jeff asked, "What was your training like?" Uh, I don't know if he means you know training for the employees about improvements, but he asks, uh, "Small groups, large groups, how many lessons did each mm. person get? Was it self-paced, manager-led, etc.?" So we currently have a training program that is based on small groups. The, I had mentioned earlier we have an internal lean leader, and he does a lot of the, the support of Kinexus. All of the training uh, really is the first line of communication for people who need help with the software. And he works with, with new employees as part of the onboarding process. He does um, training that's sort of job specific based on how people are going to be using the software in small groups. And then he does a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with managers on dashboards and reports and a little bit more detail on how the software is done. And so our, our training is sort of as needed and, it, and it's custom but we've had good results with that so far. It sort of lets us tailor the training to, to how it needs to fit that person's job and role. And then also having that one point person that's really spearheading Kinexus lets us keep up to date with the improvements in the Kinexus software because he's the one that's really checking up on all the new features that are coming out for the software so that we're able to take advantage of the ones that are relevant. Here is another question from William. Uh, well, thanks for attending and for the questions, William. If numerous improvements occur, how does standard work stay current or get updated? Uh, that's the, it depends is the answer to that question. So a lot of the, if it's something like like shortcuts, that's not really built into our standard work. But something like uh, Nate, like the way that you name a file it, and file structure is very important to our business. Um, and that's not something that people have the ability to change independently. And so the basically there's this leeway for people to make improvements adopted improvements until it starts to really impact standards. And then that's when we have to kind of use that opportunity for improvement platform to adjust the standard work. And so it, I guess that's maybe not the most clear answer to that question, but I guess it's the um, certain things are standard and certain things that we consider like means and methods or personal preference aren't. Hmm. And we encourage people improving both and the improvement of one influences the improvement of the other. Yeah, I think, I mean, that raises an interesting point about what does it mean to be standardized? I mean, I, I tend to use the word, I tend to call it standardized work instead of standard work. And, and, it's just you know, it's a couple of extra letters and a syllable. Um, Toyota uses the term standardized work, and I, I think that's important because I think when, when people hear standard, at least with people I'm working with in healthcare, I think people sometimes overreact. And when they hear standard, they hear identical or they hear inflexible. And I think standardized raises the issue of what does need to be done very consistently for the sake of safety or, or performance, and, and what are some things, what are some areas where variation is okay or doesn't make a difference? Do, do you see, I mean, kind of a, a, a way of distinguishing standard practice that way, or how, how do you guys describe that? Yeah, that we haven't talked about it that way before. I think the clumsiness of my explanation sort of betrays that reality. <laughs> and I really like how consistent it is to apply that methodology of standardized work as opposed to standard work. So I think that that's something that we might work into our own vocabulary. 
I think that's an important an important um, framework for thinking about this. Mm-hmm. And I, mean, I didn't think you said it badly, but you know, I think it's just that that's a really common topic out there. And I, and I think one other set of phraseology I would suggest is you know negotiable versus non-negotiable. That certain things are very non-negotiable. Um, let's say, for example, if, if you go and get uh, blood drawn, um, you know, it's non-negotiable that the person collecting that specimen wear gloves. For right. Their safety and yours. How, you know, and, and there might even be standardized work that says, you know, welcome the patient and greet them in a friendly manner without turning that person into a robot who has to say the exact same 12 words every time. You know, right. there's, there's um, room for personality and preference, even, even in the context of standardized work. And as, as you said you know, a little while ago, it depends. You're becoming a, a good lean thinker when you answer questions with uh, it depends. Um, that, that's really kind of the only honest way to answer some of these questions. Um, as, we, as we wrap up here, um, Jeff had one other question maybe we can touch on. Um, I said, our initial SharePoint implementation is also stalling after a little bit more than one year. I, I'm assuming he means tracking ideas in, in SharePoint. Um, did you have trouble helping people keep the faith in an attempt to get an improvement system like Kinexus in place? And, and maybe we can convince William to try Kinexus instead of SharePoint. But wh- how, would you, how would you answer that question about helping people, quote unquote, keep the faith? I guess that can mean a lot of different things. But. I think that for us, there was an excitement around Kinexus. We spent a lot of time working with the team at Kinexus before making a purchasing decision. And a lot of the managers were overwhelmed with a number of our improvement projects. And that led to them embracing this improvement platform. And I think that that, you know, making it a sort of collaborative decision to get Kinexus led to more buy-in and helped with that right out of the gate. And having really clear messaging, acknowledging what it was that SharePoint didn't do well, that Kinexus will do well for you, is important. And just like... um, we're all rational beings, or at least most of us, and so engaging people in a conversation and being honest, I think, is really the best way to deploying a new software and explaining why it's going to work. And if you have a good explanation, people are going to be excited about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we are about out of time here. Uh, Craig chimed in and said, thank you, Mark and Matthew. Um, thank you, Matthew, for um, the presentation today, for sharing um, what you've done, the lessons learned, the challenges, and, uh, and everything that you've been working on. And, and thank you again for being a, a Kinexus customer. Um, do you have a, a final thought for any of the attendees here, Matthew? No, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Those were some great questions. And I hope to see everyone at the Users Conference next year. <laughs> yes, thank you. Or this and, year. <laughs> uh, yes, later later this year. So um, thank you for that. And um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Again, you can go to kinexus.com slash webinars to view the webinar library, to sign up for future webinars. And I would encourage you, please do fill out um, the survey that's going to pop up here about the webinar we do, uh, read all of that very closely and, and look at it and thank you for your, uh, your thoughts and ideas and feedback. So on behalf of the entire team here at Kinexus, on behalf of Matthew Canestraro, this is Mark Raven signing off. <laughs>